Hey everyone, I'm Theo from ZeroX, and uh, yeah, as Jonathan said, we're gonna talk about the impact of slippage on DEXs. And I have shamelessly caught, taken the slides from Robert from my team, and uh, I'm basically gonna present them today. Um, and uh, yeah, as, as we were saying, this is a, a, an unprecedented analysis actually that we ran on data that we had at ZeroX, and we are very excited to, to share, share it with you. Looking forward to your questions as well. Uh, the extended report is actually available on our blog, so check it out at blogzerox.org. There you will see more in details this data. And uh, yeah, as, as, we, as I was saying, we've been actually presenting this this week also at other, at other conferences, so hopefully you haven't seen it before. Uh, as a bit of a background, Xerox is basically um, a family of endpoints and smart contracts that uh, are aimed to help DEX applications plug into this, this world. We build DEX infrastructure for the internet, and we connect tens of applications with uh, tens of uh, liquidity sources. Most of the time, Zero X uh, maybe might be seen as um, the old relayer network and stuff like that, but we actually evolved a lot uh, since 2017. Right now, we have a DEX aggregator infrastructure online available on seven blockchains, so we are literally connecting hundreds of thousands of users with, um, with these uh, liquidity sources on the left. So if you're interested in knowing more about the data, you have also resources there on the bottom left to yeah, follow what we're doing. All right, to the topic of the talk. We want to talk about slippage and we want to give numbers, hard numbers on that. There's a lot of misconception of what slippage is. When you go to a DEX um, interface, like here is Matcha displayed, you typically see different numbers. You see a spot price, which is the mid market on the top left. Then you input your trade and you, are, you get a quoted prices, quoted price in, in return. That quoted price includes price impact, but does not include slippage. And that's the, if you want, the message that we want to send today. Slippage actually is not shown in any, uh, pretty much any UI uh, index. And why is that? Well, that's because price impact is known before the trade, and that typically depends on the trade size versus the pool you're, you're trading with on an AMM. Whereas slippage is not deterministic. Slippage happens in the dark forest. It happens once you submit the transaction on the mempool. And that's not easily calculated before because actually it's impossible. And uh, your actually real realized price depends on the ordering of the transactions. And uh, that affects uh, directly what your price is gonna be ultimately. Typically the effects on your realized price come from random collisions, but there are some instances where there are some MEV attacks, such as you, you might have heard of sandwich bots. And in those cases, you are getting a worse price than anticipated, not because it was random, but because actively acted uh, against you. So we wanted to analyze the data and make some assumptions, hypotheses, and see whether our hypothesis matched what we had in mind. Typically, the way that you protect yourself against slippage is setting this slippage tolerance. It's usually a bit hidden. You need to click on you know, settings and things like that. And uh, yeah, uh, basically that allows uh, to introduce some protections, meaning that once your trade is submitted on the mempool, if it drifts too much, then it reverts. So basically that's your pre pre protection there. Without it, uh, you would be basically arbed pretty bad. But yeah, slippage tolerance is not enough. As, as we said before, um, after your transaction hits the mempool, there are some attacks like sandwich attacks that are kind of displayed here. Uh, they typically uh, happen um, in a series of three actions. You are the one in the middle there. Uh, you, you see them on, Meta, on Etherscan typically. You see that there's first the MEV attacker that basically front runs you and moves the price up if you're buying. Then your transaction happens at the price you set the slippage tolerance set, which is your worst acceptable price, and then the uh, villain instantly sells and they pocket the difference. And typically also the miner gets something back because they, uh, the villain, so to speak, they're also bidding 
using flashbots typically to reorder the the transactions so we started creating you know, hypothesizing a little bit how does a distribution of sleep slippage looks like and um, in our hypothesis we thought that uh, in the presence of a lot of mev bots uh, we think that the uh, ultimate realized price that you will um, obtain is actually equal to the acceptable price. So in an ideal world, you will always get what you were quoted, but with these MEV bots, basically your price is moved towards your worst acceptable price, the slippage tolerance, basically. So we had the data and we thought, okay, let's figure out whether this distribution uh, actually happens in reality. We analyzed 700,000 zero X trades that happened between April and November of last year over all the zero X API applications. So Matcha, Metamask, Coinbase Wallet, Zapper, they're using all zero X API. And we focused on AMM trades. So when the trades were routed to AMMs like uh, Uniswap V2, V3 and SushiSwap. And uh, we, uh, we had all the data points to compute that distribution. So the quoted price, slippage tolerance, and realized price. The first data point that we learned and we basically started reflected on was the distribution of slippage tolerance. This is what users set on the UI. We actually realized that uh, for, for that data set, most of the um, slippage tolerance was pretty, was pretty high, was over 2%. And that's because two very popular applications, Coinbase Wallet and Metamask, have a slippage tolerance of, of default of 2-3%, so it's pretty high. Matcha is 0.5%, is the, is the green uh, slice here. But from here, actually, another conclusion is the fact that users actually do not change slippage tolerance. They pick what the UI tells them to pick, because as you can see, over 90% are set at the 0 0.5, 1, 2, 3, that are set in the defaults of the UI. And here's the distribution that we were trying to compute. And uh, this is very interesting. It gives you, there, there's a lot to digest here, but pretty much, first of all, you can see that it's slightly uh, tilted towards the negative side, but there's a cap at 3%, pretty much. That's because Mostly none of the applications have a over 3% slippage tolerance by default. And uh, the other interesting thing, there are all the, where the arrows are, there are interesting upticks at, uh, you, you guessed it, at 0 0.5, 1, 2, and 3%. And these upticks happen because, I mean, it's pretty uh, obvious at this point, MEV bots targeted your trade to push it to the worst acceptable price. Uh, other things that we can, uh, like infer from this is that yeah it's thicker on the left side near zero so we, this is actually the, mostly the trade collisions that happen randomly but also another interesting thing on the right hand side we see that the, there's a smooth decay and uh, that's also because your XAPI does, does not collect positive slippage and it's returned to the user so all those instances where you actually had a better price than than expected that value was returned to you so we wanted to dig deeper on the left side where we have these upticks and by uh, breaking it down by trade sizes, you actually see that the bigger the trade, the, the, the bigger the upt upticks. And that's another confirmation of the suspicion that these are MEV bots attacking your trade because there's more money to be made for them. That happens on pretty much all pairs. It happens a lot actually on long tail pairs where there's lower liquidity, so there are more, more opportunities to, to sway the, pri the price. But it also happens on the very popular ones. As you can see here, uh, on the x-axis we have the uh, trade size. As the tri trade size increases, we see actually the slippage, the average slippage growing a lot. And in certain instances you see that here we have a roughly 30 bips for large trades on IFTI, but yeah, 30 bips is, is very high in terms of slippage. We wanted to also normalize the slippage, and meaning we are seeing slippage um, that is maybe 0.5%, but maybe the slippage tolerance was 3%. Um, we then divided the slippage tolerance and normalized the data to basically have a metric called the MEV exhaustion, meaning that uh, the trade was basically pushed 
to the extent that it was possible to push. And we actually see the, the uptick that we were thinking about, meaning that uh, for some uh, instances where we have uh, basically um, trades that are pushed towards the slippage tolerance, we see the, 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 the frequency picking up. And that's even more evident, so actually yeah, it's, it's matching the, the, the hypothesis that, that we had at the beginning. As you can see, the, the shape of these uh, uh, histograms are pretty similar. And it's becoming more and more obvious when the trade sizes are higher. So basically a way to read this is if you're trading more than $10,000 on AMMs, you will slip. And the likelihood is actually pretty high. It reaches over 10% when you're actually yeah, trading more than $10,000. So it's pretty, pretty impactful. The good news is that there's a source of liquidity indexes called RFQ, request for quote, that is MEV resistant. Xerox API aggregates both, both types of liquidity, AMMs and RFQ connecting directly to private market makers. And the best price is always offered to the user. The interesting thing about this type of liquidity is that it produces a, a quote that is personalized just for you at that time. So when you are receiving a quote from market makers, that's just for you, only you can take it. There's no enemy V, no slippage, no one can front run you. And it's available on all Xerox API applications. It's picking up more and more. We already are trafficking over $1 billion per the volume per month. The interesting takeaway is the, the sentence at the bottom here, is that um, due to slippage, there are actually a pretty sizable number of trades and users that would have had a better price with an RFQ order because they actually slipped. So that's the, our intention, that, uh, is to use this data to embed it in the routing algorithm. The interesting thing about RFQ is also that it, it allows for peer-to-peer -peer gasless trading. It's available only on Matcha for now, but it's a way to embed basically gas costs into the, the quoted price. And again, no slippage, no reverts. And if you want to check it out, it's, it's on Matcha. So to wrap up, and I'm looking forward to your questions, uh, what we learned is that slippage is real, uh, is hidden to users but it's real and, and it's not going anywhere. And uh, we calculated actually that there was over $10 million lost in slippage by users in Q1 of this year. So it's, it's definitely real. And if, you, if your trade can slip, it will. There will be bots like taking that advantage of you. But our plan, the good news is that we're gonna monitor on an ongoing basis this, this data for Ethereum and Polygon and, and all the other chains that uh, we are present in. And uh, we will try and model the slippage prior to the trade, so then it can be taken into account in the routing algorithm and basically get you a better price in case we think that you're gonna get slippage. With that, I think I'm done with the, yeah, with the talk. Thank you. Amazing. Um, thanks so much, Theo. And thank you to you guys. So uh, this way, the way we're going to ask questions is we're going to hand out the microphone this time. So if you have a question. Yeah. Um, so the opposite of uh, MEV was exploiting um, slippage. Um, so getting a worse execution than coded price as you index is when MEV was provide just in time liquidity on Uniswap V3 specifically, this happens. Uh, is there a way to observe that in your data as well? or? You are asking if Uniswap v3 is subject to slippage in the same way that any AMM is. Yes, but one of the things that we've seen over the past year is then, so if there's a large transaction in the mempool on v3, that an MEV bot might in real time provide a huge amount of liquidity and wrap the user transaction in this liquidity. So then the user actually gets a better price than quoted. I was wondering if you could just if you could see that in the charts that you that you indexed. Or we we haven't looked into that, but I guess it's something that we will look into. Okay. And uh, yeah, that's another interesting aspect of that. But what would be the advantage to the MEV bot then in that case? I'm wondering. Um, because like they wrap their uh, they wrap the transaction atomically, so they have for that moment they have 90% of all liquidity in the pool, so they mm -hmm. capture all the fees, um, mm -hmm. and the passive LPs get nothing. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, we'll look into that and, and update our, yeah. our blog post. Thank you. No Thank you. 
Are there any other questions? Come on, guys, this is your opportunity. Hi, I wanted to ask, what do you think about Oracle extracted value as opposed to minor extracted value? Because Oracles are also kind of playing a key role in many protocols. So can they use their position to extract value out of the transactions? And uh, have you done any analysis on it? And why don't we hear about it more often? I'm not really familiar with that, but I can imagine that, yeah, Oracles in certain protocols are used to yeah, peg basically the system towards a number. And yes, it's definitely an information that can be exploited. Um, to an extent, prices are, and price asymmetries and uh, information are basically what's arbable. And that's also what market makers do, by the way, because they add on centralized exchanges when you, they give it a price to you. But yeah, I never heard of the, this aspect of it. But I guess aggregators like Xerox CPI can, find where what the best price is on, is on in all these venues and protect the user in that way. Okay, so like the bots that are doing these this type of extraction of value, is there any way of labeling these bots and finding out like uh, tracking their activity and saying like who is the one who is controlling these bots, like which sources are they coming from? Has any this kind of analysis been done by you? They operate on... Well, m a lot of them operate using flashbots, and it's a public system with sealed auctions. So it's a bit, you know, the, the, I guess the solution you're proposing is to um, put people on the block list, pretty much, and addresses. It's uh, not really in the spirit of peer-to-peer -peer trading. But yeah, it's maybe something that we could look, look into that. But that would mean basically tracking addresses and yeah, deprioritizing addresses based on their past activity. That feels a bit, yeah, slippery slope in terms of control of exchanges. So we prefer probably to be agnostic of that. But that's a good intuition. Hey, so, <clears throat> so Flashbots has a public uh, RPC now that like users can submit to through their MetaMask and stuff. Um, does submitting to, through your transactions, like Matcha transactions through Flashbots, protect you from these sandwich attacks? Yes, that would be one way to protect your trade too. You would, yeah, you would have to change the RPC utilizing Flashbots. However, then obviously you would have to trust Flashbots not to front run the bids or things like that. But yeah, that's a, that's a solution. One thing that we learned though is that, as you've seen from the slippage tolerance distribution, users do not really take actions. Maybe people in this room, yes, now you've heard you can use the Flashbot RPC and you can do it yourself. But the next generation of users probably don't even know what an RPC is or they don't want to, you know, you know, mingle with that. We, we also connect with the applications that don't even give you that possibility. So, but yeah, to answer your question, yes. Uh, I have a question. Um, what do you think at a high level is when it comes to DEXs, what's actually like the biggest issue at the moment? Yeah, I, more than DEXs and De I mean, I abstract to DeFi. Typically, when we talk to maybe candidates or people external from the from the from the space, is always obvious. The obvious question, the obvious answer is onboarding and explaining what's going to happen, what's not going to happen, and uh, yeah, try to hide it as much as possible. I don't. I think DEXs have uh, um, evolved a lot in terms of pricing and efficiency um, through aggregators, through the evolution of AMMs, like the race to the bottom, so to speak, of efficiency, I, I think it's converging. I think where, where it's going to get interesting, is, and we see that with, uh, at Zero X when we onboard maybe companies that are not as familiar with, with, with DEX, is what is the concept of allowance? Or, okay, great, you offer gas, gasless trading, but still I need to, I cannot do that with a native token. All of these concepts are, it's still an uphill battle, but I think uh, it's important, yeah, super important. I'm stating the obvious here, but yeah, making it easier for other applications to onboard the next generation of users. 
And, and oh, you have a question. Um, so in that chart of the slippage exhaustion likelihood, so even for a trade of 100K, you've only got a likelihood of 15% or so. So why is that so low? Um, is that uh, people using RPC flashbots to protect themselves, or where's the 85%? Were, were you expecting it to be higher? I guess when you talk to the, the MEV guys, they, they sort of uh, think that it's almost 100%. Well, well, I guess, yeah, one intuition is that maybe a portion of that 85%, yes, uses, uh, since they're, they're, you know, they're launching large trades, they are, uh, yeah, using flashbots. However, yeah, I feel like uh, we were kind of shocked when we saw 15%, uh, because that means that, uh, yeah, users are really, yeah, leaving money to the table, but, yeah. Is there one more question? Otherwise, I'm going to ask you potentially a difficult question if you have an Go opinion it. on it. But obviously, we've been talking about cross-chain. We've been talking about layer twos. Like, and again, with liquidity, you're splitting it across many different points. So what is your thought on that and kind of the future of the ecosystem? Yeah, there's, there are a lot of misconceptions there, too. Um, it helps maybe to think about how we, we think about this problem with, at Xerox API. We are chain agnostic. We will go where users are. And uh, we observe that, yes, the typical evolution was a new chain com comes up. They have a big uh, incentive program. And they will incentivize these AMMs to basically spin up liquidity. And then we start seeing users <laughs> maybe subsidized, maybe not. And uh, we just follow where liquidity uh, emerges and where users are. Uh, we're pretty much agnostic to, to where to go. In terms of fragmentation of liquidity, I think um, arbitrageurs, not necessarily MEV, like even simpler, simple arbitrageurs, will, will make sure that uh, prices are aligned. And uh, they, I actually think that uh, the, the, the concept of price alignment across multiple chains will be resolved very, very easily. One thing that is going to be interesting to, to see for us, at, uh, for example, uh, is how to leverage RFQs to actually align prices and make sure that there's uh, good liquidity on other chains too. Yeah. Cool. Well, well, we'll see how it evolves. Thank you so much, Theo. Please give a round of applause. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.